I, I mean, I recognize, like Babu, I'm also partially paralyzed by the fact that the ambit of the session is so huge, and the ways in which one can interpret one's uh, mandate from IT for change in what to speak about is very, very vast. So I, I thought I would just quickly uh, try and summarize how the whole idea of rights and the whole discourse on rights has been part of the women's movement in the country. So uh, we, we who are part of women's movements, we see the whole history of the movement, at least after the, the contemporary phase of Indian women's movements after the late 70s, really as a story of rights, the idea of rights, became visible and became accepted along with our successive accessions to international treaties. I mean, the various UN women's uh, conferences, uh, starting with Nairobi and culminating perhaps in Beijing, where a document called the Beijing Declaration and the Beijing Platform of Action set out a kind of a minimum agenda for uh, making the idea of universal human rights a reality for women. And long before uh, the Beijing Declaration and the Beijing Platform of Action, we had a, a convention called CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which is actually quite old. It was mooted and it was passed by the UN General Assembly in 79 finally ratified by all except, I think, one or two countries as late as 2005. But this is really the document that is designed to interpret the universal human rights framework, which is the universal declaration of human rights, in terms of its implication for women. And the point that Parminder made, this gap or this... Uh, this uh, difference in perception of civil and political rights and social, economic, and cultural rights. CEDAW is the document that tries to bridge this gap. So for many women's movements, including uh, women's movements in India, I mean, CEDAW is seen as a kind of passport to equality. So that, this is the benchmark for women's rights that has really influenced the ways in which women's movements have framed rights. The, the question that has continuously come up and the question that has continuously been thrown at women's movements is, why do you need to have a special statement on human rights for women? I mean, the Universal Declaration of Women's Rights, of human rights, is supposed to be universal. It's supposed to apply to every human being. So why does, why does the women's constituency, why do women's movements have to continuously raise this notion of women's rights? And the discussion and the debate and the discourse around this question at the international level has actually helped in clarifying the idea of rights. So, for instance, it was feminist activists and it was women's movements who pointed out that despite the Universal Declaration of Human Rights being in force and being accepted by all governments for so many years, until 1995, Violence against women, particularly domestic violence against women, was not legally seen as a violation of women's human rights. And it was only looking at the issue through a feminist lens and pointing out that the kind of patriarchal division between the private realm, the private world, and the public world, the idea that what happens within the four walls of a home does not concern the public and does not concern the state. It was this idea that was actually preventing governments from seeing domestic violence as a violation of human rights and from using legal instruments, using laws, using uh, frameworks like human rights to punish, to, uh, to protect women and to punish violators of women's right to a life free from violence. It took us till 95 in order to bring this understanding into the human rights discourse. And this single uh, sort of point 
that feminism brought to human rights discourse, which is to say that you have to look at ways in which human rights are denied or subverted by using the idea of private realm, of family, of culture, of tradition, of looking at the ways in which these notions can be used to violate rights. This, is, this has become an extremely powerful instrument in order to articulate rights, in order to claim rights, not only for women, but for several other groups who find themselves left out of the rights framework. So this is really the trajectory of human rights discourse and practice. Step by step, human rights have been first defined and conceptualized as universal, that this is a right that everybody can claim simply by virtue of being human. And then step by step, because of various actors within this discourse showing how existing hierarchies of power actually hide or silence some elements of rights, actually hide or silence the fact that some groups are being left out of this universal definition, and push for a new and more detailed, more textured, more disaggregated definition of rights. It's this uh, sort of sequence of a universal articulation which is then challenged, which is then debated, which is uh, shown up or called out for not being universal. It's this progression that actually defines the history of human rights. And again, I don't think this is only in the case of women's rights, because every time a right is established in a new way by a new set of actors, it then applies to everybody. It again becomes universally applicable. And in a sense, uh, I think women's movements, whether in India or whether everywhere else, have been very, very central to this process of discourse have been the people who have, women's movements have been the, uh, the platforms or the voices which have expanded the rights discourse. And I'd just like to give you a few examples. For instance, the whole huge movement in India pushing for amending laws in order to make them more able to include women. Now, this is a very liberal kind of opposition that if you expand the framework of laws, it takes care of rights. But at the same time, it's a very, very powerful kind of opening wedge into questioning the way that right has been framed. So discussions of uh, access to education, the whole discussion on quotas for women as part of the right to political participation, the right to voice. Now, these... these debates have opened the idea of inclusiveness of laws. Similarly, the other approach, which is to ask for different legal frameworks or completely newly conceptualized legal frameworks to take into account differences between women and men. So if the first movement on rights is saying that rights are universal and can apply to women and men equally and in the same way, and we need to tweak laws and open laws in order to contain both women and men, then this second approach, in a sense, questions that and says that there are differences between women and men which cannot be taken into account and which cannot meet their rights through the same laws. So examples of this, for instance, are reproductive rights access to contraception, uh, rights of sexual expression, rights of sexual autonomy, uh, the whole, that whole framework of sexual and reproductive rights, which brought in very strongly into the public perception the idea that biological differences between women and men have to be taken into account in framing legal frameworks for rights. Similarly, the whole work of the women's movement in exposing the ways in which universal rights formulations actually reinforce patriarchal binaries. 
One example that uh, I mentioned is the whole question of domestic violence. The question of child labor and of violence against children within the home is another issue which is very effectively concealed by making activities within the home somehow protected and outside the domain of law. So while standard child labor laws penalize those who make young children work in public spaces, thereby depriving them of their right to education, these laws fail to look at children who are made to work within the home, for instance, the domestic work of girls. So the idea that the home is somehow sacrosanct, which is a very patriarchal idea, protects violations of rights within the home, children's rights in precisely the same way as it protects violations of women's rights. So this, this continuous challenging of laws based on how they reinforce the binary separation between public and private, between the individual and the collective, between uh, paid and unpaid work, and so on. This is a powerful instrument that the women's movement has continuously used to expand the idea of rights. And I just want to highlight in, in closing the, the biggest advances in claiming rights for women in this country have perhaps come from ruptures and debates and struggles within the women's movement. The biggest advances have not come from the women's movement challenging the state or from the women's movements challenging other movements, but women's movements challenging themselves and their own practices. So the whole questions raised by Dalit women within women's movements, lesbian women within women's movements, questions of uh, the debates on what one could call rights versus rights, uh, the debates on sex-selective abortions, on sex work, on pornography, on the age of criminal liability, on freedom of expression, all of these debates have been extremely powerful in raising questions within women's movements and forcing different groups of the movement, different political uh, positions within the movement, to turn the analytical lens on themselves. And this, I think, has contributed hugely to expanding the discourse on rights and to taking it beyond what is printed on the page into what is happening on the ground. And I think that is the divide that we continuously, as activists, whether uh, digital activists or whether activists from social movements, this bridging this gap between what is on paper, what is informal frameworks, and what's happening on the ground. I think this is the continuous challenge that we continue to struggle with, and hopefully we'll make we'll make advances. At least, at least for me personally, I think this is going to be a hugely enriching uh, space. So thank you.